uh, and uh, uh, I would like to welcome you all to our um, uh, CSOC webinars uh, series for uh, this term, the Hillary term in Oxford. And I'm Othan Anastasakis, I'm the director of CSOC. And um, uh, today is a great pleasure for this uh, webinar. Uh, this is the sixth, actually, week uh, in, uh, in Oxford. We've got eight, so this is our sixth uh, in, in a series uh, on um, the quality of um, democracy in Southeast Europe. And um, so far, we've been looking at issues such as uh, democratic, democratic backsliding, electoral majoritarian democracies, the rule of law and the consistency of the EU's approach, transitional justice and the struggle for redress, or um, media in the region. And um, for today, we have um, a very special event which uh, has to do with uh, legacies and memories. And uh, this is especially uh, delightful for us because uh, we take this opportunity to celebrate also the publication of our book last summer uh, on the legacy of um, uh, Yugoslavia uh, politics and economy and society in the Balkans. And um, this for us today is from the chapter contributors perspective. There is the book that Avis is showing us. Uh, and, um, and it was uh, uh, from the editor's perspective and uh, together with Avis Mirjanovic, uh, David Madden, uh, as well as Adam Bennett, the four of us um, started with the idea five years ago that uh, we wanted to see uh, how the Yugoslav past actually affects the present. What we can learn uh, about the present by looking at the Yugoslav past, because uh, it's not that the countries uh, in post-Yugoslavia started from year zero. There is a baggage and a background there, and a background of Yugoslavia, which was a very unique project and country experiment. Um, in the bipolar Cold War environment. A third way with its uh, semi-liberalism in its politics and society and its, in, in, in its economy as well, a more independent foreign policy and its non-alignment, uh, but also a combination of its economic model of self-management, socialism, as well as market philosophy. And uh, beyond these issues as well, our book deals uh, from other contributors too on issues of um, Yugo nostalgia in the cultural field, or issues of borders, uh, economic mismanagement during the last uh, decade of Yugoslavia, as well as current attitudes towards the assessment of economic uh, transition. And um, today we've got um, three uh, very special uh, friends and colleagues of, of our contributors uh, in the book. Uh, and uh, we will be discussing the themes that they have been addressing in this book, starting with um, Ivo Sokolic, who is a research officer at the European Institute of the London School of Economics and Political Science, and who is uh, currently working for an ERC-funded project examining transitional justice for processes across former Yugoslavia. You go together with um, Adam Fagan and Denisa Kostovicova have co-authored the chapter of our book on civil society. And then we move to foreign politics uh, with the Ljubica Spaskovska, who's a lecturer of European history at the University of Exeter. And uh, Ljubica has been working a lot on political and sociocultural history of internationalism, including development, decolonization, histories of generations. She's been studying a lot the non-aligned movement um, of Yugoslavia and the end of empires the sociocultural history of internationals between Southeastern Europe and, um, uh, and Africa. And uh, also she has a book, uh, a monograph, which is the last Yugoslav generation, the rethinking of youth politics and cultures in late socialism. Ljubica is very well placed to speak to us about that kind of memory of the third way foreign policy of um, foreign politics of Yugoslavia. And uh, last but not least, uh, a very good friend and colleague, very precious colleague, uh, Milica Uvalic, uh, who is a professor of economics at the University of Perugia, but who herself has, uh, a, you know, a lot of titles uh, in her background, uh, involved uh, very actively in the transition of Yugoslavia as well at some point as assistant minister um, in 2001 in the federal government there, but also other positions as a member of the UN Committee for, Deve for uh, Development 
development policy or public policy scholar Woodrow Wilson, among many others, and many books on uh, transition in the uh, political economy field. I just need to say, because um, uh, uh, we are uh, discussing about the book as well, that Adis Merjanovic, who will be taking uh, the second part over in the second part uh, to chair the question and answer, uh, is uh, a very dear uh, friend and colleague and formerly uh, a junior research fellow uh, at CSOX for three or four years. We did quite a lot of projects with Addis while he was um, in Oxford. And currently he is a senior research fellow at the Zurich University of Applied Sciences um, with a focus on political communication and marketing, but with his heart also still in rule of law, democratization, uh, liberalism in Southeast Europe. Addis will be taking over the, in the second part. Um, and I hope that in the audience, David Madden is there and Adam Bennett, our two co-editors uh, with whom we worked so well uh, to produce this book. Finally, I need to mention our other contributors. I already said Denisa Kostovicov and Adam Fagan, as well as um, uh, Catherine Baker, uh, James Kerlinzi, uh, Jakob Milatovic, and Peter Sampi among the contributors in our book. Um, I've asked uh, the uh, panelists to speak for 12 minutes. Uh, each yeah, for their own field. And then we will move to the question and answer session. Uh, please, uh, as you already know, some of you, uh, don't write your questions in the chat, write them in the question and answer. And please specify if you wanna ask the question live because Julie Adams who's behind uh, this CSOX logo will, will allow you to unmute yourself and ask your question live. We find it much more vibrant when you hear you know, your voices asking the questions. Uh, so with that, uh, we start with uh, Ivor, and then we'll move with the other two speakers. Ivor, over to you. Uh, th thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just uh, share my screen. Great, thank you. And uh, thank you for um, involving me and us uh, in the project. Uh, it's such a shame we can't be back in Oxford um, uh, doing this live, because I, I recall the conference uh, so fondly. Uh, when we spoke about this other workshop, rather. Um, so I'll give a brief overview of uh, essentially what our chapter discussed, and it, it would certainly be interesting to then hear questions about how already now a lot of this may have changed in, uh, in the former Yugoslavia, especially in our case studies of uh, Croatia and Serbia. Um, so just to give you an overview, I'm going to start by uh, answering why we should be looking at civil society in this context in the first place. Uh, I'll provide our framework of analysis. Um, so basically looking at how we looked at civil society broadly in Eastern Europe, where we drew this from. And then I'll briefly outline the case studies of Croatia and Serbia and how we examine them. So civil society or the role of civil society in the process of communist democratization has been deemed to be twofold. So civil society provides checks and balances on the nascent democratic state and its institutions, but it's also an advocate of human rights and freedoms, and it contributes to the deepening of democracy. So by doing so, the process of democratization is expected to unfold along an ideal typical pathway. So from the first multi-party elections to its consolidation. So in some civil society is not only indicative of the break with the previous regime, but it also becomes a litmus test of the political transition in post-communist contexts, including in uh, Yugoslavia. So the emergence and existence of civil society can therefore provide us with a true test of the discontin discontinuity or continuity between uh, the previous regime and the new regimes. Um, so because civil society is uh, antithetical to the essence of communist rule, which is premised on this obliteration of uh, any type of social organization outside of state control. So the development of civil societies in post-Yugoslav states, as well as their impact, has been molded by different contexts. Um, so while the similarity of all post-Yugoslav states should not be overstated, uh, their development was defined by the common political legacies of the former Yugoslavia. 
Um, and in addition uh, to this, and unlike the trajectory of civil society development in other parts of Eastern and Central Europe, civil societies in the former Yugoslav space were also impacted by the violent disintegration of Yugoslavia. So in fact, the war was in many ways uh, formative, not just for the development of civil society, but also for the development of the post-Yugoslav states. So we analyzed this um, oh, apologies, I just realized I made a spelling mistake there uh, by using a framework uh, by Ekert and Kubik um, to test this discontinuity. And so we operationalized our analysis along these three dimensions. And these are the relationship that civil society has with the state, the form of organization and institu institutionalization of civil society, and how civil society gets involved in uh, public and uh, political life. And certainly in the q and I can go into more detail as to exactly how those work, just so I don't uh, drag this out. So what we then do is we offer this comparative assessment of the emergence and strength of civil society in Croatia and in Serbia. And the analysis draws on empirical data um, uh, from particular sectors within civil society in both countries. Uh, and these are environmental organizations in Serbia and transitional justice and veterans organizations in Croatia. Now, the focus on these particular sectors allows the diversity of organizational forms, uh, the variation in empowerment and in efficacy, and sort of the developmental trajectory of post-Yugoslav civil society to be uh, fully captured. And then when we conclude, we reflect on reasons why the growth of civil society organizations does not necessarily coincide with the unequivocal contribution to democratization, uh, as well as peace building. And we consider the complex ways in which the agency of civil society in the context of democratic transition marks political discontinuity with the politics and policies of uh, communist Yugoslavia. So starting with Croatia, uh, so Croatian civil society has provided pressure for democratization and for the most part it functions without significant institutional impediments. However, it becomes limited uh, when and if it attempts to challenge the key identity narratives uh, of the nation and state building projects. So that's of a Roman Catholic nation born out of a heroic defense against Serbian aggression. And three types of civil society groups best exemplify this. So these are war veterans associations, fact-finding organizations, and language institutions. Um, and these show the legally protected position that Croatian civil society groups have, uh, but also the funding is used to give some more opportunity to impact policy than others. Um, it shows that civil society is pluralist with some corporatist elements, but that ethnic identity of, group, of, of these civil society groups is key. And also that civil society is contentious within the context of a weak party system, but this contention is very much dependent on which party is in power and how they can manipulate civil society groups uh, to maintain power or gain power. So the form of organization in Croatian civil society is pluralist. And what this means is that civil society actors are diverse, they're interest-based, they're predominantly formal and highly decentralized. Um, however, the legacy of ethnic conflict has resulted in collective identity playing a large role in how civil society is organized. Uh, this is probably best exemplified by war veterans organizations. Uh, there's a huge number of uh, formally registered uh, associations. At the time of writing of the book, it was about um, six and a half thousand. Uh, I think this has increased. Uh, and they also gain a privileged position in Croatian society. So this multiplication and fragmentation of war veterans associations, uh, as well as their close association with the nation building project has made it easy for political parties to manipulate them and especially political parties coming from the right. Um, this is because of their shared priorities regarding the uh, conflict, um, which have essentially resulted in special benefits for these associations who see uh, certain political parties uh, as a way for them to uh, protect the Croatian nation building project, but also to access more funds and powers. However, the implication is that these associations are no longer focused on their rehabilitating function. Instead, they prioritize political aims, uh, often to the detriment of other ethnic groups and to the detriment of democratization. 
uh, civil society in Croatia gets involved in po political and public life in a generally contentious manner. But again, this is dependent on who's actually in power. Um, here again, we see a dominance of war veterans uh, associations, uh, especially. Uh, but also what we see here is the influence of a uh, relatively, or this legacy of a relatively uh, weak uh, political uh, parties in Croatia. And uh, most governments therefore prioritize appeasing uh, war veterans organization, uh, organizations uh, due to their potential to disrupt and challenge uh, the government. Um, and the power of these associations can really be seen uh, by the scale of their demonstrations that they've held over the years. So the key insight here from Croatia is that the legacy of ethnic conflict actually plays um, a leading role in sort of diverging outcomes in terms of civil society development in Croatia uh, to this day. So in Serbia, the attitude of Serbia's political elites towards engaging with civil society um, has arguably been the key political and ideological battle, battleground uh, since the collapse of Yugoslavia. Uh, so since the 1990s or since the early 1990s, uh, civil society has stood as the frontier between reform and stagnation, between a further descent into semi-authoritarianism and genuine uh, liberal regime change. And certainly over the last sort of year or two, uh, essentially when we started, since, since we sort of started writing this book, we've also seen uh, where this has gone, where this has progressed. So in terms of continuities and discontinuities with the communist past, uh, the polymorphous civil society that exists today would seem to have an obvious link to the anti-authoritarian and pro-liberal dissident movement uh, of the communist era, rather than to the nationalist activism of the late uh, Yugoslav period. And on the surface, at least, Serbian civil society today appears to resemble that which exists across uh, much of Central and Eastern Europe. Um, and this normalization, uh, as we call it, is characterized by four very broad and by no means rigidly defined categories. So we see a formal tier of apolitical, semi-institutionalized, uh, non-governmental organizations and think tanks uh, that are largely dependent on international donors. Uh, but they're gradually gaining some access to political and public life and acquiring domestic support and supporters. Then we have a long established network of politically engaged human rights advocacy groups uh, whose focus on war crimes and transitional justice, um, but also increasingly, increasingly LGBTQ, race, gender and identity politics uh, has often made them the prime targets for nationalist attacks and certainly uneasy partners for reformist elites. Uh, third, we see a small tier of community situated civil society organizations that campaign on local issues and they increasingly venture into the political arena, although quite tentatively. And then finally, we have um, a final grouping of emerging radical grassroots protest politics. Uh, and most notably here is uh, Nedavimo Beograd, Let's Not Drown, um, Belgrade, uh, which started more as a movement and has progressed into a civil society group. Um, now, the fact that all four broad categories of civil society are weaker, more ephemeral, and far less politically discernible than their Central and East European counterparts reflects the particular recent history of Serbia. Uh, so the way that Yugoslavia collapsed uh, and the lack of a liberal democratic revolutionary moment at the end of the 1980s, um, the legacy of Milosevic, and the subsequent delayed or interrupted transition and then the particular path of Europeanization on which uh, Serbia has embarked. So the professional NGO with no overt political affiliation or obvious ideological compass uh, operating as close as possible to the policy process is no less ubiquitous in Serbia than elsewhere in post-communist Europe. Um, and successive rounds of donor project calls have shaped the issue agendas and focus of these organizations who have gradually acquired project management capacities and built up technical expertise. Now, the dividing line between these professional NGOs and what we term as uh, civil society organizations is quite thin and porous. Um, and we gain a good sense of the interaction between the two types of organization uh, from the perspective of environmental activism and politics. So most of the registered environmental civil society organizations, like the larger NGOs, exist as formal entities due to the availability of international donor funding. Uh, and often, no, well, almost always, although not always, uh, 
exclusively from the EU. And with a few exceptions, um, it is hard to contest the assertion that the NGOs and the civil society organizations either have no political clout or are able to exert very little influence at elite or societal levels. So in this sense, they're typical of the kind of civil society iterations that flourished across post-communist uh, Europe in the 1990s and 2000s seeking voice and influence within the established order there. So what we see in, when we're comparing the two studies, to case studies is that the basically Croatia and Serbia captured this ambiguous state of civil society in the post-Yugoslav space. Um, so Croatia and Serbia, although different in many aspects, they shared two crucial components that affected the, the development of civil society uh, and it's the legacy of conflict and a slow transition to liberal democracies uh, since neither regime turned liberal overnight. Now at times civil society aided processes of democratization but often it exerted pressure in the opposite direction and undermined the liberal transition. Uh, now the effects of the legacies of Yugoslav communism, nationalism and conflict are therefore all in inextricably linked. And this also highlights that no one model can capture these diverging paths of post-communist uh, civil societies. Um, so what can this analysis tell us specifically about the continuities and discontinuities from the former Yugoslavia? Well, the post-Yugoslav uh, political space in successor states is no longer under this omnipresent control of a totalitarian state. However, neither do new post-communist civil societies play an entirely benevolent role in the process of democratization. So both normatively and organizationally, the civil society space is a space of pluralism. However, civil societies are often purveyors of nationalism as well as challengers. And as a type of actor, they often hold the state to account, but they can also act as extensions of the state. So in this respect, the discontinuity with the former Yugoslavia is evident. However, so is the long shadow of its legacy that shapes the role and form of civic activity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ivo, for uh, giving us uh, this um, uh, excellent presentation on the current state of uh, civil society and how the various layers, various legacies, uh, going back to Yugoslav times, but also conflict and then you know, transition to democracy as well, have been uh, affecting the way these have developed uh, in the two cases of Croatia and Serbia. Um, now we move to uh, Ljubica to discuss uh, uh, foreign politics. Thank you very much, Othon, and thank you for organizing this uh, uh, as well. So uh, I will, uh, we were asked also to reflect on memory. Uh, so I've just completed a, another uh, text, another chapter on uh, memory and post-socialist citizenship. So I thought also I will bring in uh, some of those uh, ideas from, from there. Uh, so uh, it's, I, I think it comes down and just reflecting also on more recent developments uh, in the region, it really comes down to this notion of institutional uh, memory. And I think Serbia stands out uh, here when we think and uh, about this legacies of non-aligned multilateralism, uh, precisely because also uh, Serbia uh, has, has been acting uh, uh, as the successor state of the former Yugoslavia, but also inherited a lot of that infrastructure, right, not least uh, uh, all, um, the, the, foreign, uh, uh, the foreign ministry, not just archives, but also, uh, uh, as I said, the, the, the whole diplomatic infrastructure as well. So uh, uh, here I borrow Alida Asman's notion of uh, uh, um, that uh, institutions, as well as larger social groups, such as nations, governments, the church, uh, do not have a memory but they make uh, a, mem a memory for themselves with the aid of memorial signs, such as symbols, text, images, rites, ceremonies, places, and monuments. Uh, so in a way, I was trying to sub subvert that to uh, kind of look at uh, 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 and uh, unpack it and see also how the unmaking of that uh, memory of internationalism and non-alignment also has uh, has uh, evolved uh, uh, in the region. So not just, of course, non-alignment, but also anti-fascism and self-management as three important dimensions of socialist uh, citizenship. 
so in my uh, chapter, uh, I, uh, uh, I basically uh, argued that the recent rediscoveries of the Yugoslav uh, internationalist uh, and non-aligned uh, past really reflect very different in the different successor states' uh, ways of engaging with that past, but often conflicting uh, ones uh, as well. And uh, what is obvious is the selective appropriation of socialist Yugoslavia's legacies of uh, global engagement via the non-aligned movement and via the United Nations. And in the Serbian case, uh, which was especially visible since 2011, when they hosted uh, the 50th anniversary summit of the non-aligned movement in 2011, uh, the so-called what James Caird Lindsay uh, calls the foreign policy of counter secession, right? Basically, lobbying for uh, former and non-aligned allies and present allies in the global south, uh, and not to recognize Kosovo's uh, independence. So uh, I also try to uh, to argue in the chapter that this demonstrates uh, uh, also an acute lack of awareness and knowledge about some of the concrete policy uh, orientations and achievements of non-aligned multilateralism. So that nowadays it's very much reduced to this performative uh, dimension, uh, especially as I said, seen in the in the hosting of this uh, 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 Jubilee 50th uh, anniversary summit. But what is kind of left out, uh, uh, what is forgotten and uh, uh, very much is that those particular, um, uh, particular paradigms of uh, development and international economic relations that very much defined what uh, non-aligned movement was about, especially in the 1970s. So, and which has been my uh, area of interest, uh, which has guided also my, my research at the UN archives in Geneva and, uh, and New York. So in 1961, in the Belgrade Declaration, right, uh, at the founding moment of, of the non-aligned movement, it was economic development, which also was uh, center stage. Of, uh, and as, as we can see here in this excerpts from, uh, from the Belgrade Declaration, uh, uh, economic uh, development is, uh, uh, is basically explicitly mentioned and uh, connected with uh, uh, what will later become the United Nations Conference for Trade and Development, which was very much the initiative of, of Yugoslavia, Egypt, and other developing uh, countries. So, and as you can see at the end there on that slide, the achievement of international social justice. So this discourse, uh, right, has been uh, has been forgotten, as has been uh, forgotten the whole uh, project and the uh, very uh, passionate debates at the United Nations around the new international economic order in the 1970s, where very much again Yugoslavia and Algeria and other uh, third world countries were at the forefront. So. This loss of institutional uh, uh, memory, as I said, uh, again, to reiterate, is uh, uh, this uh, lack of knowledge and awareness, but also uh, the fact that European integration and market, uh, right, uh, the transition to market capitalism uh, has completely, in a way, overshadowed uh, this for uh, this uh, past uh, debates and investment and involvement in, uh, in a uh, a project about a new international economic order. However, recently, as you can see also on this uh, slide, the UN revived uh, some of this, uh, some of these discussions, and uh, uh, specifically mentioning that some of the postulates of the new international economic order from the 1970s are relevant for the 2030 UN Sustainable Development Agenda. But to my knowledge, so I'm not a political scientist, I am a historian, but to my knowledge, in none of the successor states, this has uh, been uh, um, um, a subject of public debate or uh, any substantial academic or political debate, uh, indeed. So my research has also led me to a number of these institutes. So uh, uh, beyond the performative uh, right, dimension of non-alignment at the time, uh, this was also uh, uh, very much underpinned by academic debates. Uh, and uh, perhaps Milica, having worked on development herself, can recognize yeah, some of this. So I did some research at the Institute uh, for uh, Public Enterprises in Developing Countries in Ljubljana, which has been renamed after 1991 uh, into the Institute for the promotion of enterprises, uh, conveniently, also the Institute for International Politics and Economy in Belgrade, and the Institute for Africa in Zagreb, which is now the Institute for International Relations and Development. So in that sense, right, non-alignment was not just a diplomatic project, but uh, for me, it's interesting to see how it filtered down and how now this 
underfunded institutes, uh, which was uh, what I could notice, right? And uh, here the state priorities are very visible, right? Uh, the, the libraries at the Ljubljana Institute, the, uh, the library was closed and uh, it, it was, uh, yeah, not very pleasant to see kind of this decaying state of, of all of this. Uh, the Zagreb Institute is doing well, but also the one in Belgrade has lost that relevance that it had in the 70s uh, and 80s, which also tells us about, yeah, as I said, about prior current uh, priorities of, uh, uh, of uh, the contemporary successor states. In my chapter, I also mentioned uh, uh, another initiative where Yugoslavia played a very prominent uh, role, which has been also kind of uh, completely forgotten and other countries have taken it up, uh, the non-aligned news agencies pool. Uh, so this was part of the uh, uh, project about a new world in uh, information and communication order where Tanyuk, the Yugoslav state, uh, news agency was at the forefront of this uh, initiative in the 70s and 80s. But recently, as you can see here, it was the Malaysian, uh, uh, the Malaysian state uh, news agency that took over. And as you can see, it says this is the, the non-aligned news network uh, that, they, uh, that they resurrected is the transformation of the now defunct NANAP, the non-aligned news agencies pool uh, of the 1970s and 80s. So again, the region, right, uh, is for, uh, for the region in a way and for uh, policymakers in the region, non-alignment is very much uh, a history, uh, uh, a historical footnote, whereas elsewhere, as we know, uh, the non-aligned movement is still very much alive and with Azerbaijan presiding over it over the past uh, two, three years, right, it has taken a very different shape and form as well. But these debates are continuing elsewhere, right? Outside, uh, very much outside of the region. Um, so uh, one of the conclusions I drew also in the argument that of course this past is very much instrumentalized uh, for, for pragmatic, for uh, sometimes for diplomatic uh, reasons uh, such, uh, uh, and this was the case when uh, Serbia, right, was uh, uh, had the Bukeremic as a candidate for uh, president of the General Assembly. Also when Croatia was running for a non-permanent uh, membership of the Security Council. So this is when these networks are mobilized again and uh, this becomes relevant. Uh, in, in the cultural sphere, in the sphere of public history, again, this uh, 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 kind of ambiguous relationship, uh, the attitude towards the socialist past is very visible, whereas you can see here uh, for the 2020, the Eka City of Culture initiative, uh, right, the Galeb ship was brought in uh, to be renovated, but there is no mention there of, of non-alignment, at least not in, uh, on their official uh, website. So in a way, kind of it's, it's glossed over uh, uh, and uh, in a lot of these exhibitions I discuss in the uh, chapter, there is this uh, also almost imperative to distance uh, for the artists or for the organizers to distance themselves and to say, no, this is not about nostalgia, but nevertheless, here are some positive legacies of, of, that, of those global engagements. Uh, so I will end here and happy to take uh, more questions later. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ljubica. That was uh, great, and uh, we will come back to some of the points you raised, indeed very interesting. And now um, we uh, proceed with Milica, who, unlike all her other presentations, this time she will not be sharing a PowerPoint, but she will be speaking the transition uh, in the economy. Uh, thank you, often. Thank you. thank you very much. I think that uh, in these... Um, difficult uh, times of corona, it's more effective to speak and not ha having a PowerPoint presentation. Now, first of all, I want to say how pleased I was to be invited to contribute to this project because I think it's uh, also the volume we have produced is quite unique in trying to link the past to the present. Uh, former Yugoslavia with its uh, successor states 30, almost 30 years later. Uh, today we have many books about Yugoslavia uh, in various areas, also very recent books, but somehow I think this issue of continuities has really not been uh, uh, addressed so far as, uh, as far as I know, and uh, from various angles, politics, economics, society. Um, my chapter was dedicated to the Yugoslav uh, economic model, where in fact I have tried to um, see whether the model actually influenced uh, the transition path in uh, its successor states, whether there were continuities. And of course, 
uh, the answer to this question is not at all simple because after Yugoslavia's breakup, uh, each country really had a very specific uh, transition path, its own trajectory. Uh, and in fact, uh, we see that the transitions uh, in the successive states of Yugoslavia have really uh, advanced at very different speeds uh, with different contents and so on. Uh, and of course, if we want to see whether anything has remained of the old model, we have to recall that Yugoslavia really had a very specific economic model. Of course, Yugoslavia was a socialist country with uh, many features uh, typical of other East European countries. Uh, but Yugoslavia also started uh, very early with market-oriented uh, uh, economic reforms. And, and I would say that in 1989, uh, Yugoslavia was probably the most reformed uh, socialist economy. Uh, not only, but of course, uh, Yugoslavia was known for its unique uh, system of self-management. Um, and last but not least, Yugoslavia's economy greatly benefited from its uh, specific international relations. So uh, not by chance, we see that just at the moment of the breakup, uh, Yugoslavia already traded uh, prevalently with the West. Uh, more than 50% of its trade was with uh, Western market economies. Um, so what happened uh, after the breakup? Uh, of course, at the moment of the breakup, uh, we have to recall that some important uh, reforms were already uh, launched by the last Yugoslav government of Ante Marković. We already had also the first multi-party elections in all republics uh, from April to December 1990. Um, and at that moment, uh, the republics, the Yugoslav republics did uh, inherit uh, similar institutional features Although, of course, there were very important differences uh, among uh, these economies in the level of economic development and the structure of their economies, trade orientation and so on. And after the break, um, of course, the speed and contents of the transition were very much determined by the general uh, political conditions, uh, which I would say were certainly much more favorable in Slovenia than in the other countries. Uh, Slovenia had a number of advantages, so it is not um, naturally, it's um, not um, surprising to see that it advanced much faster. Uh, Yugoslavia was less profoundly hit by the political and economic impact of the breakup. It had a number of uh, economic advantages being uh, not only the most developed among the republics, but also the most developed country uh, in uh, Central and Eastern Europe at that time. Uh, it already had a strong export uh, oriented industry. And of course, uh, contrary to the other countries, uh, Slovenia was able to uh, benefit from early support from the European Union, both, both regarding financial assistance and uh, access to its markets through an association agreement. Uh, and so Slovenia implemented its transition fairly uh, quickly, uh, much faster than the other countries. And this, despite the fact that Slovenia actually had a gradualist uh, strategy of transition in comparison to a country like Poland. In the other countries uh, of uh, former Yugoslavia, we see that the transition was uh, interrupted or substantially delayed by the military conflicts, by uh, international sanctions, uh, by major political and economic stability. Uh, and considering the contents of economic reforms that were implemented thereafter, we see that uh, actually Slovenia is the only country, I would say, um, that uh, has uh, retained uh, ve vestiges of international, of some institutional features of the previous economic model, building on some of the advantages of the uh, previous system. Uh, for example, regarding workers' participation, uh, Slovenia adopted the co determination law already in 1993, which ensures workers' uh, representatives on company boards. It also uh, has uh, many enterprises have a system of profit sharing where workers are given um, uh, uh, bonuses linked to this, as uh, happened uh, in the case of self-managed uh, firms in the past. And uh, also privatization has uh, led to sales to managers and workers 
Um, so it is the insiders that have very frequently retained uh, control over enterprise um, policies. Uh, regarding the other countries, of course, each country uh, is a specific story and I can, cannot really go into the details, but in those countries that applied uh, reforms uh, later, um, uh, here I primarily mean uh, the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, uh, Serbia and Montenegro, many features of the old system have obviously survived uh, for a, a whole decade. But once uh, more radical economic reforms were implemented, uh, they, they were not accompanied by the introduction of uh, institutional arrangements which resembled uh, in any way the old economic model, but just on the contrary. After the difficult decade of high political and economic instability, most countries adopted a liberal, hyper-liberal uh, model of transition based on a radical break uh, with the past, uh, abandoning uh, the features of the previous economic system. Uh, the legacies of self-management were dismantled, introducing the standard wage employment contract under which uh, today, for example, not even uh, basic workers' rights are fully respected because of weak rule of law and the absence of uh, control over policies of uh, powerful foreign multinationals. Uh, although initial privatization laws did take into account uh, the old system of self-management, uh, in fact, all countries did uh, introduce a, as a method of uh, privatization, the sale of uh, shares to employed workers and uh, managers, further changes led to the concentration of ownership of outside uh, owners, frequently foreign companies. Um, so uh, we also see that there have been some reversals in reforms that were undertaken in former Yugoslavia. Uh, since some firms, for example, were renationalized, uh, all firms in former Yugoslavia were in social ownership, but with the start of transition, we see that many uh, countries decided to first renationalize these firms in order to proceed uh, with privatization in an easy way. So um, the overall account of transition uh, in the Yugoslav success states after th almost 30 years is unfortunately, I would say, not very positive. Uh, many expectations have not been uh, fulfilled, uh, not only political, I, I will certainly not go into those, but uh, many economic expectations. If we look at the level of uh, of uh, economic development, we see that these countries are really substantially lagging behind. Only Montenegro has recently reached 50% of GDP per capita of the EU um, uh, average um, uh, GDP per capita. Um, and these countries are strongly uh, dependent on, on foreign capital inflows, perhaps even more than Yugoslavia was uh, um, uh, before 1989. Um, there has been increasing social differentiation, I would say, in all countries, uh, without exception, with the high unemployment, uh, no sufficient uh, employment, new jobs, uh, rising income inequality and poverty. Uh, and of course, uh, there are many other problems uh, which uh, have also uh, very much uh, influenced the very high uh, emigration rates from, from the region. Uh, last but not least, EU, EU, regarding EU membership, of course, at that time, uh, when we think of uh, the possibility, there was a certain possibility of Yugoslavia actually becoming an EU uh, member state in those uh, dramatic years while it was about to uh, break up, but EU membership was... Uh, Actually, um, only Slo Slovenia was able to join in 2004. Uh, Croatia did manage, but only in 2013. And today we can uh, ask, uh, when will the other countries become EU members? Uh, it is uh, clearly not going to be soon. So somehow I would say that today people are greatly disillusioned. Uh, there's widespread disappointment among the populations. And this is one of the reasons why uh, so many young people, the best educated people are leaving uh, the region to look for better living standards uh, elsewhere. 
so in concluding, uh, Slovenia has been uh, certainly much more successful from the other countries implementing a model uh, based on gradualism and continuity, building on uh, previous uh, systemic features rather than uh, implementing a radical break uh, with the past. Uh, but of course, Slovenia had political stability, something that was uh, not there, not present in any of the other countries. And so it was a big advantage. And if I um, have another minute, I would like to um, add one final issue. I was actually asked by one of the uh, referees when I already finished my paper, uh, what can be seen as the most important positive legacy uh, from former Yugoslavia inherited by its uh, successor states. Um, and I would say um, that um, it is the high degree of openness of the country to the outside world, which facilitated cross-border flow of people, goods, services, technology, ideas, uh, culture, social values, this advantage uh, was actually lost with the breakup of Yugoslavia uh, because borders were closed and visas were uh, introduced uh, for most countries. And it is only in December 1989, uh, sorry, December 2009, almost 20 years later, uh, that the visa regime was actually lifted uh, for Macedonia, Montenegro and Serbia and for Bosnia uh, the, the, the year, uh, a year later. So these long years of isolation have not uh, certainly benefited the consolidation of democracy and rapid economic development, uh, I would say, on the contrary. Uh, my paper also addressed many other issues, including the controversy about the Yugoslav model of self-management. But uh, of course, uh, you will have to read my chapter in order to and more, uh, know more about these controversies among economists. Uh, and I end here, and I hope I have not uh, spoken uh, too long. Thank you. In fact, all of you have uh, kept uh, to time, and uh, it's been terrific. Thank you very much uh, for giving this uh, kind of round of those uh, different topics. Um, uh, Milica also gave us a pass for um, uh, Julie also to advertise a link uh, because we've got a discount from, um, uh, from the publishers uh, on hard uh, book, but also e publications or PDF 35%. Um, I would like, before I uh, leave the stage uh, and hand over to others, uh, to maybe ask one question each. Uh, because you've been so punctual with time, that provides me with the opportunity to do this. Um, I would like to ask uh, Ivo first, um, how is that memory of um, uh, a, 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 a kind of lively opposition and to a degree civil society in, in, in places like Croatia, for instance, or Serbia, um, has any kind of weight to the civil society of today? When you speak to people, do they remember the Croatian Spring, for instance? I remember myself when I went to Kortula recently for a conference. That was a, you know, a big point that it was raised to me, how you know, new ideas actually were discussed in, in Kortula and Croatia. Then I'd like to ask Ljubica, and that connects to my chapter on, on Russia and, um, and uh, Turkey as well, uh, in uh, former Yugoslavia and what we've got today, whether you believe that there is uh, in the leaderships of today in the elites a neo-Titoist approach that is, you know, the legacy of that kind of independence in the sense we, we can engage with everybody. We are allowed to do this, it's to our benefit, but at the same time we know how to do it because of our Yugoslav background. And with Milica, uh, because you ended with self-management and that was such an original kind of Yugoslav idea, I'd like to know whether, uh, you know, from your kind of understanding, self-management still has any kind of resonance to any other place around the world, or is it a completely dead idea? By the way, it's very interesting that, um, you know, self-management, uh, which was something that uh, was so revered and admired by Yugoslavs at the time, it didn't create the social capital you know, that we would have expected in order to keep Yugoslavs together during the conflict. It just disappeared completely, you know, with the conflict, sadly, and all this solidarity from that model 
completely disappeared. So these are my three uh, questions and I just hand over to Avis now to manage it um, uh, as you wish. By the way, please put your questions. I see that you've already put in the question and answer and we will allow you to ask them uh, live too. Thank you, Alphon. I think we should start by giving you the opportunity to address those questions that Alphon has raised, which we have time for. So maybe Ivor, you would like to start? Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll leave, uh, I would say David's question, David Madden's question is sort of also related, but I can come back to that. Um, uh, so yeah, so it's a really interesting question. I mean, how is the memory of opposition alive? And I think this speaks to one of the continuities, which is that there was uh, dissidence, there were certainly vo opposition voices in Yugoslavia, if not quite organizations. Um, the Croatian Spring is an interesting example, perhaps, because it's uh, potentially an opportunity lost, perhaps more for historians to discuss than for myself. But the way then that gets remembered today is through the lens of the 1990s. And unfortunately, the 1990s then uh, provide a lens for, especially in Croatia, as in the other sort of countries that were hit by the conflict, of a very different way of looking at Yugoslavia's legacy. Um, and what we do not see is, although people will speak about, yes, you know, we had the right to express uh, dissenting opinions then like we do now, none of the organizational structures that were there at the time have continued to today. So there is this discontinuity from that, and then the memory of the Croatian Spring is often portrayed as this is why Yugoslavia was a negative, because Croatian independence or Croatian rights were suppressed, uh, rather than focusing on any kind of dissident voices that could have been there, and so on. Thank you. Let's move on to Ljubica and the neo-Titoist approach of certain politicians. Yeah, I think it's, uh, well, uh, with the recent choice of Serbia, right, to buy vaccines from all different corners of the world, I think that's a, that's a yeah, yeah, great proof of uh, kind of this uh, policy. And uh, um, I would say the Serbian elites uh, are, are most uh, kind of uh, the ones uh, invested in uh, maybe replicating certain certain aspects of, of non-aligned multilateralism. Uh, but again, I, I I think it's quite tokenistic. It's selective, oftentimes, right? And uh, uh, it, rather than pursuing that kind of, that was also a generational story of that kind of neutrality. Because also, I think uh, I didn't mention, but I think non-alignment was very much Yugoslav non-alignment was a generational project. It was that uh, that generation which embodies this kind of long rise and fall of 20th century anti-colonial internationalism from the interwar period. We shouldn't forget all the, the entire Yugoslav elite, partisan intellectual elite, right? They had very important experiences in the interwar period uh, as, as well as transnational experiences, right? They, that informed their understanding and their worldviews. Uh, of international affairs. So I think that's quite absent. Uh, it was absent in the 80s in the new technocratic generation that took over, but it's even more uh, absent in right, this uh, new generation of politicians as well. Uh, in the Republic of North Macedonia, if I may add, uh, now there is a great disillusionment right, with the European project in terms of, uh, first they told us the road to Brussels leads through Okrit, uh, then it was through uh, Prespa, right? And now the road to Brussels leads to Sofia. So how many detours we will have to take so the, and I've I've heard also yeah uh, people reflecting on you know is there an, an another alternative you know should we kind of yeah uh, turn away and reflect on other on other parts of the world or other alliances etc. But this is very much as I say there there is no substance to the in the way that I think um, uh, non -align, Yugoslav non alignment had also as I said this academic and intellectual underpinnings uh, beyond uh, like pure pragmatism. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Milica, would you like to take yes. on the question about well, self-management? You know, after the 1990s and all the terrible things that these 1990s brought to, to most countries, of course, somehow uh, I think there was this intention to leave everything behind as much as possible, as soon as possible. And so uh, perhaps it's, it's in this... Uh, uh, desire to uh, create better policies, better societies, better uh, economies, political systems, that some of the elements were simply not, uh, they were abandoned, they were uh, left behind. And this is the, this is the case with uh, self-management, because of course, 
today, you know, we in the Western market economies, we have workers' cooperatives. Uh, the workers' cooperative is very much, uh, is very similar to what used to be the Yugoslav uh, labor managed firm because uh, workers uh, have the right to vote on the basis of one man, one vote, et cetera, et cetera. But then also, if we consider other forms of economic democracy, if we consider, I mentioned co-determination laws, uh, it's not only Germany and Slovenia and the northern countries, uh, co-determination laws uh, enable uh, workers' representatives of, on company boards, and this is another form of, uh, of uh, ensuring workers' rights. But then uh, uh, there are other, um, uh, for example, forms of uh, ESOPs, employee stock ownership plans in the US, but also elsewhere. Uh, we have uh, firms that are being uh, bought by workers, uh, um, firms that um, risk to be closed. Uh, so workers buyouts are another example where actually uh, workers uh, take over their enterprise, uh, certainly better than closing them down. So despite all these uh, examples that we do have today, of course, they're not the dominant forms, but somehow this was, uh, uh, really not taken into account in any of the countries except uh, Slovenia. Uh, and uh, somehow I think that um, uh, very frequently there's this blame of self-management of the features that you, some features that Yugoslavia had, not because of self-management, because but because of uh, other characteristics that were linked to its socialist economic model, or at least uh, this is the way I see it. Thank you, Milica. Um, before I turn over to, to uh, the right to ask questions to the audience, and please also uh, put your questions in the F&A and then indicate whether you would like to be uh, to ask the question live or not, or whether I should I should just summarize it. Um, I would like to ask a question of all of you, and, and it kind of became evident when, when listening to you and also when reading the book. Um, we, we all agree that there is a legacy of Yugoslavia in some way, shape or form, as, as applied to all these different areas that we look at, whether it be politics, culture, the culture, economics, and so on. But to what extent, so there, there, is, there is a common origin, if, if you would like to simplify things, but to what extent is it actually okay to speak of a post-Yugoslav space? And we, we have been grappling with this question a lot when, when we were writing, uh, how do we use, how do, do, we, do we call the region which we are writing about? Because uh, listening to you, I mean, Ivor made a wonderful point about the varieties of civil society actors and, and, and what they have been doing in one country as opposed to the other. So there are already six varieties in two countries that we have with Ivor and just looking at Serbia and Croatia. Then, of course, uh, Ljubica made the same similar point as varieties on the adaptation and the memory of the non-aligned movement of this Yugoslav um, of this Yugoslav past in international relations that is trotted out when you need to make Jeremic the president of the General Assembly or to, to secure Croatia a seat but with, which is used quite eclectically and quite sporadically and quite instrumentally I might add uh, just to gain further uh, further um, to, to make political gains and then of course Milica spoke about as you actually said each country had a specific economic trajectory and we cannot group them together in a way. And of course, Slovenia being the most prominent example of where it worked differently, but also all the other countries had different economic challenges to overcome, be they from the, the late adaptation of the economic models, the adaptations at all, or be they also because they were simply dealing with the war and the post-war reconstruction that, that of course hinders economic development. So my question to all of you, and I don't know who wants to take the, the this hard question on, is whether there is a post-Yugoslav space, because I think of Catherine Baker's chapter in our, in our book where she actually says, that in the music, in music, in the culture, all these musical performers, they perform in all the countries of the former Yugoslavia. So there might there needs there is some kind of a culture post-Yugoslav space, but is there a general thing that we can call the post-Yugoslav space and what binds it together? That would probably be my rather difficult question to start with. I hope you're not expecting me to start because <laughs> it's a very <laughs> difficult question. Well, um, I, I can start if... Uh... 
Well, uh, perhaps I'm biased, but I do think there's still uh, very much a post-Yugoslav space. And, and this has really emerged just a few days ago with the death of uh, George Balashevich, who is one of the most uh, famous, West, most well-known uh, uh, singers, um, pop singer um, from Vojvodina, but actually uh, because of his uh, music that was really, uh, uh, listened to in all the countries of, of former Yugoslavia, because he's not, I mean, it's not music from former Yugoslavia, it's something that he really uh, create, uh, sang many songs after the breakup. Uh, there was um, so many very touching uh, uh, episodes of remembering uh, Balashevich in Zagreb, uh, in Split, uh, and in other cities. And, and this really shows how uh, perhaps in certain, well, in certain areas, culture, uh, certain values that were uh, perhaps shared and perhaps are still shared by, by parts of the population uh, that these values uh, are there. And uh, just a brief uh, issue, um, a comment about the interlinkages. You see, uh, from the economic point of view, uh, these countries are uh, still very much uh, um, linked uh, together. You, you know, uh, Tim Judah wrote a very nice booklet some years back about the uh, Yugoslav space. But if you look at trade flows tomorrow, today, uh, of these countries, you will see that uh, despite the fact that they are all trying and they do have the dominant part of the trade uh, with the European Union, there are two countries actually, Kosovo and Montenegro, that are not sufficiently competitive on EU markets and that still have a higher share of their trade uh, with the other countries in the region, uh, um, simply because they're not competitive on the EU market. So, of course, this is very much pursued also politically, the regional uh, cooperation project, uh, the Berlin process, and so on. Uh, so, uh, somehow, I think the economic interlinkages uh, are still there, uh, much less than uh, 30 years ago, but they're still there, and they're bound to remain. Um, so, that's it from my part. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree uh, with Milica. Even if there was never a Yugoslavia, right? I think as a region, we are bound to collaborate, to cooperate, right? There, there is bound to be a flow uh, of people, of uh, ideas, of culture, especially when there is a linguistic sphere as well. So hence, you mentioned Tim Chu, that he also spoke about the separate uh, Albanosphere, if I remember correctly, like just because of this linguistic difference. So I would like to add here again the, the generational perspective because it's definitely there is a new generation, I think also among, uh, let's say, uh, Macedonian Albanians, uh, Albanians in Kosovo, perhaps that do not feel so um, emotionally, let's say, culturally connected to the other parts of the former Yugoslavia. But definitely uh, for us, you know, who, uh, who were singing uh, Balashevich's song, uh, Let There Be No War in the early 90s as children, there is very much that connection uh, uh, still as well. So I think it's on a very personal level, uh, it, 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 it's very important, yes, uh, our individual experiences uh, as well. Uh, but also because I did my, uh, my PhD and my book on the last Yugoslav generation, again, uh, th those, those links, of course, uh, those people who were uh, very much uh, involved in this activist movement. So from my perspective, there was a socialist civil society, but that's perhaps a debate for another, another uh, panel. Uh, these people are very much in contact uh, with each other the right uh, as well so um, yeah perhaps we can we can say that there is still uh, a cultural sphere although it's not homogeneous and it's very much was fragmented in some ways I mean if I could um, uh, follow up please uh, I think uh, Georgia Balashevich is a really really interesting example actually because I think um, talking about um, I mean I suppose the notion the concept of space is already a uh, difficult one and quite a controversial one uh, in the region where often some space is also also that there's attempts to raise it right of what was the Yugoslav space but I, I also think um, in terms of what is in the space what is shared there are these repertoires these challenges uh, these customs and traditions that that were certainly shared beforehand 
Um, and I think now when we look at Balashevich, there's also this sort of negative. I mean, I don't know if any of everyone's seen the sort of controversy over Balashevich uh, in terms of the sort of prejudices he had, which he wrote about Albanians, for example, and also these sort of negatives that are still obviously shared in the region and held in the region that are a continuity. And there is a shared space in terms of these prejudices that are shared specifically within the region. Um, and I mean, speaking about, okay, is there anything in civil society here? Well, war veterans, uh, who were on opposing sides in the conflict uh, actually collaborate uh, with each other better than they collaborate with other, other organizations on their own sort of ethnic side. So certainly there is something shared there that something about it makes it easier for them to collaborate across that formal conflict line. Thank you very much. Indeed, um, I have an, another question on that, but I'll leave it there for the moment. It's a, it's a topic we can discuss. I would like to start and open up the questions to the floor.